All right, everybody. Well, thank you for your patience during our transition. And uh, welcome to our first talk, Vanishing Point, Reimagining the Meaning of a Mesh. As, uh, as Keith mentioned before, this is the third annual Istio Day North America event. Pretty cool that we've been doing this for a while. But before that, uh, we had three actual annual virtual events called IstioCon. And before that, there was Service Mesh Con. So if you've been around in the community a number of years, we've had a lot of different iterations of this sort of content. Uh, a lot of us have been together in the community for a number of years as we've moved from company to company or project to project. Uh, and if you think all the way back to the first Service Mesh Con, back in 2019, we met in San Diego. Uh, and as you can imagine, 2019 was pretty early days for Service Mesh. So in just about every talk, all day long, there was some segment titled, What is a Service Mesh? And you might be able to imagine that back in 2019, we all had different ways to answer that question. So we're going to be, oh, did I skip a slide? No, I didn't. OK. We're going to go back and look at some of the answers that we gave in 2019. We're going to then start to reevaluate that question. It's 2024. We think we probably all know what a service mesh is by now, right? Maybe not. We'll see as we go along. But let's, uh, let's go ahead and kick off our montage of Service Mesh Con 2019 coverage here. Uh, but the point of the service mesh is to give you an API into your application network. It's so hard to define what a service mesh is. It's um, really trying to allow uh, complex networking to be brought to a developer very simply. Sidecar proxies deployed next to each of our application instances. And it's a fairly common and consistent pattern across any of the service mesh implementations. How many sidecars is too many sidecars? Service mesh is infrastructure. Infrastructure is supposed to be boring. We're working very hard to make it boring. And all the exciting stuff should happen on top. That is secure by default. So all the traffic between all your pods is going to be MTLS encrypted, end to end, layer 7 traffic management. Because everybody talks about how awesome it is and all the problems you can solve with it. Service meshes are complicated. Do you really need a service mesh? It's a lot to fit in your brains. To mesh or not to mesh? Kubernetes and service mesh are very, very hard to, le to learn and master. Um, how, do you, how do you deploy this service mesh so that it's transparent to the rest of the applications? Service mesh products are about helping you with the service mesh you already have today. The single benefit of a service mesh is consistency. The single most important feature that a mesh provides is identity. So the nice separation brought by service mesh really made it easy. All right. So uh, quick introduction. My name is Mitch Connors. I'm a principal software engineer at Microsoft. I've been working on the Istio project for six years now, where I currently serve on the Technical Oversight Committee. Hi, I'm Justin Pettit. I'm a senior staff engineer at Google. I've been working on Istio for about five years. Prior to that, uh, I worked, I was an early developer on software-defined networking, and I thought when I switched over to Service Mesh that I wouldn't have much overlap, but really this move to Ambient has really uh, combined the two. Now, as we listen to all of the answers to what a service mesh is, all the different ways of approaching the question, I think we probably heard a few answers that uh, would stand up today that we might be willing to repeat today, and others that maybe were a little bit different from how we've come to think of it. Uh, but I want to invite us to start from scratch today. Try to reimagine what it means to have a service mesh and get down to the essentials. Uh, not talking necessarily about the details or the incidentals of how service mesh works, but what is the core of what a service mesh does? What is essential to it? Uh, so to that end, I wanted to take us through a little bit of a history tour uh, of where service mesh came from. At the top of the list, you see some technologies that you probably don't associate closely with a service mesh. Uh, 1998, F5 launches, or F5 networks launches the big IP device. Uh, it's a bare metal load balancer for L7. And you can start to do some very interesting things like routing based on path or verb or headers. Uh, so not a service mesh in the modern sense of the term. And yet when you talk about the things that it does, there's actually a decent amount of overlap. Uh, one thing about hardware, though, it's always going to be in a centralized layer. 
Uh, and that was probably the thing that made it most difficult to scale with the big IP, is when you're standing up a new instance, a new data center, or even a new network topology, you need to start with a six months procurement cycle. Uh, not quite fast enough for the scale we've come to expect with virtual machines and containers. Moving forward, 2014 saw the advent of Spring Boot. Instead of being a centralized utility, this was completely and utterly decentralized. It was a library that needed to run in every single instance of your application. And it could handle any application anywhere as long as you wrote it in Java. Uh, probably not applicable to most of us today. Uh, most of us live in polyglot environments and have to interact with multiple language stacks at the same time. Uh, and additionally, upgrading Spring Boot became rather difficult because, again, it lived in absolutely every instance of your application. So when you have a Spring Boot vulnerability that needs to be patched, you have to update your application absolutely everywhere it runs. And there's also subtle incompatibilities between different versions so that when you're running different versions across different instances, you can run into edge cases. Uh, in 2016, we got to the 1.0 release of Linkerd, and that's probably where we would say the first true service mesh uh, was launched. Hats off to them. They ran a partially centralized model, uh, a software proxy per node uh, on Kubernetes. Of course, this is 1.0. This is not how Linkerd works today. This is looking back in time quite a ways, but they sort of split the difference. Not completely centralized like the big IP, not completely decentralized like Spring Boot, but somewhere in the middle. Uh, Istio got their 0 0.8 release in 2017, and they went the more, we went the more decentralized path. Uh, we ran one proxy per pod, so just as decentralized as Java Spring Boot, with the difference that now you could work for any application in any language. You didn't have to be Java-based. You could run .NET, you could run Go, you could run JavaScript and Angular. Uh, and the, but we went the decentralized route, so a lot of the difficulties that you saw in upgrading Java Spring Boot are going to be consistent in early implementations of Istio that are very much tied to the sidecar, as we heard a lot about in the, the video montage a few minutes ago. 2022 saw the advent of Cilium Service Mesh, which again sort of swung that pendulum back a little bit and went more towards a partially centralized proxy, running one proxy per node again. Uh, that has some advantages in terms of orchestration, in terms of resource utilization. It has some disadvantages in terms of your security model. Uh, so we're, we're watching this trend swing back and forth over time. Uh, and when you, if you've watched a pendulum swing, you know that any point you see it at one side, in another few moments, you're going to see it at the other. <laughs> so if you're a user trying to keep up with this, which one are we going to do, centralized or decentralized, you're going to find yourself adopting a new service mesh technology approximately every two to four years. Uh, and that's going to be a lot of friction. Istio Ambient Mode was announced in 2022, and we're hopeful that rather than just picking the average between the two extremes, we've gone ahead and split the pendulum. <laughs> Uh, we've put some of the resources very close to each pod in your network to handle security and identity. And we've put other resources that require quite a bit more compute, complexity, have more CVEs and updates further from your pod so that you don't have that same upgrade tension. Uh, so this is our bet on the future of Service Mesh uh, and how to escape the TikTok evolution that Service Mesh has seen over the last 10 years. Yeah, so uh, you know, there's an analogy that's been brought up many times in the past, which is that infrastructure is really a lot like plumbing in your house. You know, it's, it's critical, and you really don't want to spend a lot of time thinking about it. But when you have problems, it's all you can think about. And, you know, and a lot of times, too, the like, issues, things can be working perfectly well for a long time. And then all of a sudden, you don't notice it, but an issue pops up all of a sudden. And Service Mesh has not always been great about um, making it disappear into the infrastructure or into the ether. And so what we wanted to look at is, you know, is there a way that we can better manage uh, the Service Mesh? And that's where Ambient came along. So I think, you know, hopefully most people have already read a lot of the blog posts and seen the information about um, Ambient Mesh, so I won't go into a lot of the details about all the benefits, but just briefly, um, there are significant uh, CPU and memory um, benefits uh, in reduced memory and CPU allocations as well as usage. Uh, we're reducing the uh, management complexity, um, and it's a lot less invasive to, to workloads, and we'll get into why all of that is uh, in later slides. 
the, uh, as part of the uh, new release of Ambient in Istio, uh, there's a reference implementation. Uh, and it's great, you know, there's, we see all of the benefits of the ambient approach. Um, but what we wanted to look at, is it possible that we could make it even more ambient uh, than what we're currently shipping? So here you have a traditional Kubernetes network. Uh, you have the, the pods uh, represented by these C and S uh, workloads. And they connect to the CNI and they uh, just communicate and everything just works through plain text. When we want to introduce Istio with a sidecar, uh, we require restarting the workload and then modifying the pod spec and inserting a proxy, a sidecar, next to each workload. So it's relatively invasive, but then you get all of the benefits that we've discussed of uh, you know, it, it, uh, um, visibility, um, security, and network control. But it's a lot of things that we need to manage, and it's fairly complex. With the ambient reference architecture, what we did is we got rid of those sidecar proxies and instead replaced it with a per node uh, L4 lightweight proxy. It doesn't do any L7, <clears throat> but it's responsible for handling identity and encrypting the traffic. And in the reference implementation, uh, it's with a proxy, it's a new project that is within the Istio project called Ztunnel. And that's a Rust-based L4 proxy. <clears throat> And then if someone needs L7 policies, then what we do is we spin up a full Envoy proxy as a separate pod and then redirect the traffic for the, for the pods that need to have that L7 policy enforced. And so you know, everything is much more dynamic. You don't need to, um, to schedule things. You don't have to do as much resource allocation in, as you previously did in the sidecar models. However, this still introduces this layer that we have to manage. So we have the Z-Tunnel and the, the, the cluster proxies that still need to be managed. So one of the areas that we've been exploring as a project is, can we move some of those Z-Tunnel, or move that Z-Tunnel functionality into the CNI? Can we enhance the CNI so that it can do things like that encryption and that identity? And so we're actively working on that. Uh, that still leaves the uh, in-cluster proxy uh, that, we're, that, uh, that we have to deploy to do the L7 services. <clears throat> but we're starting to look at a lot of service providers have managed proxies, uh, internal load balancers. And so then what we could do is we could use those enhanced proxies and then redirect the traffic through those managed proxies so that there's no additional infrastructure that has to be maintained by the person who wants to use service mesh. And, you know, and we can imagine going forward for some service providers, they can actually provide all of this functionality themselves. They can do the, the CNI and you know, have their own um, scalable ILBs. And so then it really does just become part of the, the infrastructure. The user doesn't have to think about managing it. They only use the APIs so that they can configure what they want and you know, everything else disappears. So, we have to look at that last slide a little bit. I'm going to go back and just imagine what the user experience is here. We've moved from sidecar model, where to answer the question, do I have any CVEs, all you have to do is look at every pod everywhere uh, and run them through a regex search on version number, to the ambient model, where now you've only got one proxy per node plus a few Envoy proxies. And by the way, upgrading them doesn't require restarting your application or taking an outage or anything along those lines. Now to the point where, if we imagine just a few years into the future with a completely managed version of Ambient Mesh, the user could be completely unaware of the fact that their software has a proxy at all. As far as they know, they've got a few APIs like Gateway API and HTTP route and authorization policy that they write. And the things that they express, the expectations that they express in those APIs, they just happen. They don't need to think about what the infrastructure is required to happen, uh, to make those things happen, much like none of us think about what bare metal racks need to be spun up in order for our cloud VM to start up. We just trust that it's going to be there and that our cloud provider takes care of it. Um, you might ask, without the sidecar, without the Z-Tunnel, without even a waypoint proxy that's visible in the cluster, is this really still a service mesh? Uh, by a lot of the definitions we heard in that introductory video, I would say, no. Uh, some of them did talk about the need for an API that controls the network, and that's really what we're zeroing in on. 
Um, now this, is, this has stirred up a lot of conversation of is this really a service mesh? And I think to, to help with that conversation, it's helpful to look at a few other technologies that have gone through similar transitions. How many of you drive today or have driven an electric vehicle, all electric, or all electric drivetrain? You can have a hybrid, yeah? And how many of you needed a different driver's license to operate that vehicle? I don't see anybody. Uh, an electric vehicle it has very little in common mechanically with an internal combustion engine vehicle. Uh, there's really no transmission or the transmission is a very different idea than it is. Instead of having one motor as in an internal combustion engine, many electric vehicles have a motor per wheel. Uh, there's all sorts of differences. And of course, one of the key differences with electric motors is they can start and stop on a dime. Uh, there's no need for the engine to be on uh, and, and the vehicle to just begin rolling the way that it does when you take your foot off the brake on an internal combustion engine vehicle. And yet, every electric vehicle that is rolled off the line, uh, by default, has that exact same mode. You take your foot off the brake, you start to roll forward. That's a complete approximation. That's totally not necessary for electric vehicles to do that. They usually have alternative modes that allow e-pedals so that you don't roll forward. The reason that they did that is to make the experience of operating this completely new vehicle feel exactly like the experience of operating the vehicles that we all learned to drive on. It's about familiarity. Uh, essentially, what they've done is taken all of the implementation, all of the infrastructural details, and replaced them entirely, but the, you might say, the API or the human interface to the vehicle is the same. And this is the same thing when we build applications for Linux. Our applications might run on Alpine or Ubuntu or RHEL or Gentoo or Arch or who knows what, uh, but the basic kernel functionality is going to be there consistently every time. Sometimes it's implemented quite differently. Sometimes it's on an ARM processor, other times it's on an x86 processor, but we can trust that once our code compiles for that platform, it's going to be able to run because consistent APIs are exposed throughout and we don't need to worry about the implementation details. This is what software engineering has always been about. It's about abstracting away as many details as possible so that we can talk about the details that we still care about and not have to think about the rest. And of course, the best example of this happening in recent years is Kubernetes. How many of you are running straight open source Kubernetes? Oh, I got a hand there, two. I'm gonna say somewhere in the neighborhood of 1% uh, of our audience is running straight open source Kubernetes. Uh, and I, I'm gonna assume that the rest of you are not in the wrong place. You're also running Kubernetes, uh, just not one of the open source, uh, or not the open source distribution, but rather you're using a cloud provider's Kubernetes or you have a separate distributor who helps you run your Kubernetes. Uh, what is Kubernetes at this point? It's not the code base that sits on GitHub. Uh, that's a wonderful thing. It's very valuable. It's very useful. We should keep contributing to it and moving it forward. But what Kubernetes has become to all of us is a set of APIs for portable application orchestration. And any cloud provider that can give you those APIs with similar or the same functionality, you don't really need to worry about the fact that my implementation at AKS is gonna be based on containers. It's Kubernetes running on Kubernetes. Justin, at GKE, you guys run things differently. It's not Kubernetes running on Kubernetes. You have internal infrastructure that takes care of those things. And no one in the audience needs to care because it all operates the same way, consistent APIs for consistent behavior. This is what we believe is the future of Service Mesh and of Istio in particular. Uh, so I wanna revisit that initial question that we asked, what does it mean to be a Service Mesh? I will put to you that a Service Mesh is a set of APIs that consistently drive networking functionality across a variety of environments. Consistency means you need to be able to operate the same way. You should be able to pick up one utilization of Istio's ambient or more ambient mesh provided by a cloud provider, move it to another cloud provider or to open source, and it behaves more or less the same. Uh, it's networking functionality that we're talking about. We're still gonna be talking about the three core pillars of Istio, security, observability, and traffic control. And yet, that control should operate over a variety of environments. There's no reason that we need to talk about limiting this to Kubernetes anymore. If you can have an API that gives you the same guarantees over applications that run in a VM or another container service, or I think someone's working on like a, a Wasm-based fork of Kubernetes that only runs Wasm containers, 
as long as you can show the same APIs that have the same functionality over the network for those compute, uh, then you have an Istio service mesh, in my opinion. Now, what happens to all of the sidecars, all of that plumbing that we talked about? It's still very important. Uh, a, a good service mesh is still going to need scalable, well-architected infrastructure. Uh, but once you've evaluated that infrastructure and determined that it's well-architected for your needs, you should be able to stop thinking about it. The infrastructure should simply vanish, uh, and you should get back to doing your job. So that's our vision for where we think Service Mesh is headed. That's where our companies are investing to drive both the Istio project and our own implementations of Ambient Mesh. Uh, and thank you very much for coming to our talk. We're happy to take any questions. I don't know if we actually have time for any questions or a mic for any questions. I should have asked in advance. Two minutes for questions. Thank you. Oh, yes, sorry. Ambient mode is going to make multi cluster setup easier or more complicated? Okay, so the question for anyone who didn't hear is will ambient mode make multi cluster setup easier or more complicated? Uh, the answer is that today there is no multi cluster support in ambient. That's not a feature that has gone to GA or even to alpha yet. However, we are hard at work in the community each and every week bringing multi cluster. We began that effort, I'd say, approximately around August. Um, and I'm keeping my finger, this is not a commitment, I'm keeping my fingers crossed for an alpha early next year. Uh, and the way that it's shaping up, I expect it to be much simpler. Uh, for one, the designs that we're discussing today are all multi-network based. There is no mode to run ambient multi-cluster where every cluster needs to know the IP addresses of every other cluster. If you want to put them in the same VPC, that's fine. It'll run just fine in multi-network mode in the same VPC or in different VPCs, and we don't need nine different nearly identical pages on the docs showing you, well, if you're running your multi-cluster this way or that way or the other way or this other other way, there should be one way to run ambient multi-cluster mode. That being said, all of that is still in unapproved design phase. We're just beginning implementation. Uh, so I look forward to hearing your feedback this February when we get it out for alpha and hear how we did. Yeah. Great question. So they, they are, uh, the question is, when upgrading, the, the, I think you're talking particularly about the Z tunnel, the per node L4 proxy, do all the pods become unavailable on that node? Uh, the answer to that is no, and we do have uh, integration tests that cover that scenario. We'll upgrade the Z tunnel back and forth a bunch of times and watch for disruption. Now, you will experience disruption to long running TCP connections. There's no avoiding that. We're passing your TCP proxying from one instance to another, from one port to another. So there is a disruption. It's not invisible to the application, but for pretty much any modern L7 HTTP stack, that's not going to result in unavailability. All right, I'll take one last question and I think we have to close it up. So is the eventual goal that Istio just gets assumed into Kubernetes as just another network implementation or that it is providing something special by existing outside of the core Kubernetes code base? Did you want to try that one, Justin? Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that we're, we've, we've had some of those discussions. Um, I do think that we are going to see, like, you know, is usually what happens, you know, things get abstracted and move up. I do think that, th that we are going to see some of those ambient functionalities brought in. Like, there have been conversations about bringing some of the L4 functionality, like, around I authorization policies, adding those to network policies so that we can, um, you know, some of that, I think, will be subsumed by Kubernetes, by the other, the, the subsystem as time goes on. So I think that we're okay with that, and that's one of the reasons that we are also looking at using uh, other alternative APIs in addition to Istio, such as Gateway, and, you know, adding these things to network policy, too. But we'll keep our own project, because it's too cool to be able to have, like, a, a day one or day zero gathering like this for uh, just folks interested in Istio. So they'll work together pretty closely, yes. but I think we'll always have something of an independent identity. Well, thanks, everyone. It's been great being with you. Uh, if we didn't get time to t get your question, we'll be at the back of the room if you want to come chat. <laughs>